Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. We're going to give folks a couple of minutes uh, to join, and then we are going to kick things off. As a reminder, this uh, webinar is sponsored by Variato, which is an awareness uh, technology company, and we are going to get started in just a couple of minutes. All right, we are a few minutes past the hour, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Hi everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on the human-centric approach to data loss prevention. This webinar is sponsored by Variato, which is an awareness technologies company. Um, we're gonna dig into a lot of uh, stuff here. Before we do that, uh, just a quick intro um, on me. I'm your speaker uh, for today. Um, some background on me, I've been in the cybersecurity industry for over a decade now, um, led a variety of different cybersecurity uh, functions for uh, large companies like United Airlines before taking on my current role as the founder and uh, CEO of Cyber Pop Up, which is an on-demand cybersecurity um, services platform, also earned a PhD in security engineering, um, and so just a huge cybersecurity um, uh, nerd all around. Uh, today's topic actually holds a special place in my heart, my first uh, job uh, over 10 years ago was actually um, sort of uh, managing a DLP solution in, again, a, a major global airline, right? And so I know both the value and the struggles of traditional DLP solutions uh, firsthand. Um, I can still remember sitting in front of a screen staring at some um, 600,000 alerts, um, literally, um, and wondering how I was going to ever get through them all. Um, at that stage of my career and honestly it was just a mess so i almost have uh, like flashbacks of a, 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 a maybe a little uh, dash of uh, ptsd um from from those experiences but all of that um has kind of helped shape uh some of the things that i'm going to share here today right and, and give some of that that insight we'll also have suzanne um from very auto do a demo at the end to give you some insights into um, technology that already exists today and is already working well to help address some of the challenges and things that we're going to talk about. Now, digging into the agenda, we're going to cover again quite a quite a bit of, of ground in this session. So we'll talk about the evolution of enterprise data loss prevention. Um, we'll get into some of the recent trends uh, that are um, making it a, a bit challenging uh, to rely solely on traditional uh, DLP solutions. We'll go through some real, uh, real examples of how insider uh, threats specifically um, have increased some of the risks around uh, data loss in organizations. And that will lead into sort of why uh, some of the things that we're doing today may not be enough. Um, and then finally, we'll get into uh, really, you know, how we can build a robust, a more human-centric, more user-focused approach to data loss prevention to meet some of the, the modern 
uh, trends and some of the modern challenges that we're seeing today. And then again, you'll get that great solution overview at the end from uh, Suzanne. Um, now, feel free to uh, put uh, questions in the chat. I'll make sure I keep an eye on those uh, throughout the session so that we can try to get through um, as many as uh, as many as we can. So please uh, don't be shy. Feel free to, to ask any any questions in there. Now digging right in, we all know that you know data loss prevention. I'm going to uh, um, abbreviate this as DLP uh, quite a bit, right? But it's a part of a company's overall strategy that focuses on uh, both detecting and preventing the loss, um, the leakage, the misuse, any of those things when it comes to data, because um, ultimately, right, that leads to breaches, that leads to exfiltration of um, uh, data in, in places where it shouldn't be unauthorized use and beyond. And so a comprehensive solution, right, should provide your tech team or your security team or whoever the case uh, may be with visibility into the data on the network and how it might be uh, leaving as well as empower um, uh, response to that. Um, and when we talk about data, right, we're talking about data that is in different um, uh, states, right, data that's in uh, in use, data that's in motion, data at rest is how people tend to categorize it, right? But ultimately, all of these, all of this boils down to data, right? I've said that word at least 10 times now, and we're right, we're still in the, the beginning of, of the session, right? But this data is so important. It's become, in this day and age, one of the most critical assets in an organization. And I think that as the value continues to, as the value of data continues to rise, all right, as it becomes more valuable, it's almost um, neck and neck with the value of the the hardware or the devices that it's on, right? The value of the software and the processes that are using that data. Like all of these things are part of a very close knit ecosystem, right? And so I think the value of data in that sense just continues to um, to rise. And then when you think about the way the data is being used today, right? Both for good in terms of everything from companies using um, uh, data on uh, in social media aspects to like marketing to ad spend to the competitive advantage that data can uh, can give organizations and everything in between. Um, again, this data is just as important as the uh, assets that it, it sits on, right? And so, um, knowing that that continues to rise, right, that also makes it more attractive to um, folks who are malicious or to, you know, people who are looking to whether it's, you know, commit fraud or, or whatever the case may be, this data, because it's increasing in value so much, it is targeted much more, right? And so no secret there, that's not new, but definitely something that's important to um, keep in mind as we set the context for this conversation. Now with that increasing value also comes the fact that data is more fluid today, right? So um, the device that data sits on now has no boundaries, right? With everything from the mobile device evolution to all of the migrations to the cloud, to having employees working at home on planes and trains, um, everything in between data is on the move at this point. And so it's that fluidity that also adds to the, some of the complexity um, and this evolution of the need when it comes to data uh, loss uh, prevention. Another uh, thing, and I've touched on this a little bit, right, but all of these uh, changes make data just more targeted in um, in general, right? So now that the the threat landscape has expanded so much or evolved so much to include areas that traditionally um, may not have been at risk, right? It's like when you now have uh, data that is being used to do everything from maintain critical infrastructure and, and operate critical infrastructure um, to uh, monitoring and managing food supply to managing a pandemic, everything in between. It's like all of these uh, heightened uses of data and heightened values, again, lead to it being a more attractive uh, target um, and great opportunity um, for attackers out there. Now, what that leads to then, of course, is more regulation, right? So when we know that something is super valuable and we know that it is also at grave risk, um, then of course, like regulations start to come out to try and protect that as much as possible and to try to put guardrails around it, right? And so as this evolution um, happens in terms of the, the critical asset that data has become, you see a lot more regulations that are applying in this space, right? Everything from GDPR to California's uh, privacy uh, rule to um, not just privacy, right, but the actual security and protection of, um, of of data. When you think critical infrastructure, for example, there are certain 
um, uh, data that if it gets into the wrong hands, right, could lead to national security issues. And, you know, that's just one example. And so um, all of these regulations that are also coming out to try and, and uh, protect uh, critical data are um, uh, contributing to this evolution as well. And so um, the bottom line here is that as the world evolves and as networks and users um, and their, you know, characteristics and the way that they operate continue to evolve, DLP requirements, of course, have to shift um, as well. And oftentimes these solutions focus on how you can address data loss at the network uh, cloud and endpoint level. That's how these uh, um, uh, solutions have traditionally worked, um, which, you know, don't get me wrong, super important, right? We cannot overlook that in today's world, um, you have to pay attention to device security and everything in between, but you also have to pay closer attention to the user, to the human being behind these actions, um, because the human being plays such a critical role in uh, the data loss process, right? And so how can solutions adapt to that in the modern, the modern world? Um, and so before I get into that, because again, that that's a, a great, uh, like huge tee up to like the importance of this human centric approach, right? I mean, I'm gonna share just a couple of stats that highlight the reality of the challenge and kind of who um, who is behind some of the data loss that's happening today and what are trends there. So some of the biggest drivers, um, according to uh, one report, 63% uh, of data loss is caused by privileged IT users. Um, so think, you know, it, it, administrators, system administrators, everything in between. Attackers very intentionally target these folks because of the level of access that they have and because of the way that they're able to leverage that access to, um, to you know, get into more sensitive data, to create new accounts, to do um, other things that um, can be uh, very detrimental to a company. Um, and then the other piece is it's not just external folks getting in, uh, external attackers getting in and, and trying to leverage those accounts, right? It's also the abuse of um, inside uh, employees or contractors who have that elevated access um, and are using that access to uh, then uh, create opportunities for data loss. Another one is uh, just managers in general. Um, so put privileged access aside, right? Uh, Managers often have access to um, IP and access to sensitive uh, data. Um, and so in this case, you know, when you think everything from uh, engineers who might be, you know, working with your source code daily to um, your finance team and all of the projections and things that might not, not be published, a lot of people across organizations tend to have access to data that, that you don't want to be, you know, um, uh, accessed by unauthorized parties. And so um, I, that's another huge kind of area of concern here. Um, another one uh, pretty close behind are third parties. Um, we talk about this a lot across the industry, right? Third parties are a huge concern when it comes to um, contractors and consult uh, consultants who may not have um, strong security controls in place or might be in introducing risk to their partners. Um, that That is another area or source of data loss. And then the last one is, you know, just general staff, right? Anybody uh, in a uh, company, whether it's uh, an em employee, a contractor, a visitor, um, anyone in between who has access to systems can at some point um, influence and cause uh, data loss. And so, another area to keep an eye on as well. Now, I wanna walk through, uh, before I get into, um, you know, what we can do about this um, and, and uh, some of how we can solve some of these challenges a bit more, um, a couple of examples. So um, this one is actually fairly recent and I think such a critical example or highlight of a lot of the things that I've talked about already. So, um, just earlier this month, um, Block, which is the company formerly known as a Square, right, who um, is over uh, Cash App, um, acknowledged that they had been breached by a former employee um, in December of last year. And essentially what happened is that um, the employee, while they had regular access to the reports and things that um, they were able to leak as a part of their past job, uh, job responsibilities, um, in the case of this leak, uh, the reports were accessed without permission um, or in unauthorized ways right after the employee was terminated or after their their engagement ended and so um, a case of you know someone who 
you know, was an employee and did have this insider knowledge, had this access to this sensitive data, um, and was able to come back in and use those uh, credentials to uh, access and leak this data. And so the leak included everything from uh, customer names to account numbers um, and other data, uh, like the um, uh, user activity um, for, for folks. And so, um, yeah, ultimately, this is a case where you know they they had to communicate to eight million customers or so about this incident. Um, still, it's it's you know early. This happened fairly recently. Still, not a clear confirmation on just how many people were um, were impacted. But again, they had to communicate to all um, to over eight million uh, customers. So this is a primary example of data loss caused by um, an insider and a prime example of the fact that. You have to, when you focus on the user, right, and you focus on um, that activity at the human being layer, right, whether a person is, you know, an employee or a contractor or a former employee, right, who has come in and is using those credentials, you should have visibility into into that. Not to mention, of course, like um, just the the table stakes practice of making sure that if someone is no longer with the company, they don't have access to systems, right, which is really important. Another recent one is uh, with uh, Twitch. So this was a uh, um, not as recent as the the one from this month, but still uh, pretty relevant. Um, so this is a massive IP leak, um, and of course, uh, data loss that uh, could have been you know prevented. Um, but uh, in Q4 of last year, the so uh, source code for Twitch, which is owned by Amazon, um, along with their uh, creator payout data and all of that just started appearing online. And so it was basically um, uh, 125, you know, gigs of data or something uh, posted. And um, this uh, person who posted it, um, their motivation or reason behind it was to foster competition um, and cause disruption with this leak. And so uh, literally hoping that this information would get into the hands of competitors or disrupt the nature of the business right and so a um, very unfortunate situation um but the 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 reality um it was said that this um likely happened um due to uh misconfigured or like user error right so another kind of um lens of of insider threat right in that uh, oftentimes we hear these things and they're uh, intentional. Like that happens, I think, way more, uh, way more often than people realize. And employees just going rogue or getting, you know, recruited by uh, attackers on the dark web. Everything in between. A lot of these are malicious, um, but a lot of them, uh, or some of them, uh, can be unintentional. Um, and so this misconfigured. Um, uh, you know, system or this misconfigured application that allowed for this leak um, is an example of that. And one might even question, you know, is it truly error? Some people can do things and make them look like errors when in reality they're actually working with someone to create some of those holes um, in your system in order to, to help attackers along. And so there's so much gray area there that um, it's important to have technology that can remove a lot of that gray area and really help you get down to the the um, the bottom of you know what users are doing in the network and and so on. Um, so just two examples there, um, and then getting into uh, quick challenges uh, with this. So I've touched on some of these throughout the stories and throughout the stats, but just to kind of tie this all together, um, insiders tend to have credentialed access to the network, right? That poses a, a huge problem, but it's something that you can't get away from, right? We can't just say people aren't going to have credentials anymore, right? And so it's like we need technology that can take that into consideration and still be able to tell when something is is off, especially when it comes to privileged users and everything in between. Um, I talked about kind of the evolution of the way that we work and things like that. And so as people use uh, their own personal devices, as well as just um, devices in general, uh, even if they're corporate uh, devices, uh, without good visibility into those devices, it's hard to track data, let alone prevent its loss. Um, and so that visibility is always key. Um, and then another piece, you know, touched on this again with the with the last example. It's very hard when someone's uh, credentials or someone's account is compromised to tell if they if it's an internal or external 
um, user because sometimes it can look um, very similar. And so that can make it harder, especially for traditional um, DLP solutions that don't have context to, uh, to kind of suss out. And then also, you know, contrary to what the name is often called around data loss prevention, right? It's actually traditionally reactive, right? It's like someone has has tried to um, leak something, or you're you're seeing that data is leaving the network, and then you react and try to stop it, which has been um, I think helpful helpful in some aspects. But I would argue like we need to be much more. Uh, proactive and much more uh, predictive in these things so that we're not just reacting to data that's leaving the network and we're actually um, sort of predicting when those things might uh, occur and addressing it much earlier on in the attack cycle or in the, the life cycle of uh, that risk. And then the last piece is that automated responses, this ties into the initial point about being reactive, these automated responses in order to actually react in ways that are impactful and efficient, it requires a lot of fine tuning. Um, and so if you don't do that piece, um, then your traditional you know, tools to a certain extent are useless. And again, this, this is coming from me sitting, staring at 600,000 <laughs> alerts and trying to figure out whether I wanted to like get up and walk away or um, actually do it. Thankfully, I love uh, this space. And so I sat there and really tried to figure out how to, um, how to like fine tune and, and uh, get it better. But um, that's, the, that's the struggle with traditional um, uh, tools versus looking at things that are more, um, uh, again, more predictive, more intelligent, that have more context, which leads into my last um, slide here around how to get this, get us shifted from that reactive um, uh, approach and that sort of limited scope and inefficient uh, way of uh, doing things traditionally into a more human-centric approach to DLP that encompasses the entire ecosystem. From, so again, not neglecting the network and the devices and the endpoints, but really looking at the, the human layer and how this ties into um, everything. And so a couple of important elements to uh, think about here, right, are that visibility and context that I mentioned. So you can't prevent data loss on data that you don't know is there, or devices you don't know is there. And so um, having that insight overlaid with um, rich and predictive context um, goes a long way, especially in the modern uh, threat landscape. Um, along those same lines, uh, that context and that intelligent analysis um, can be done through more modern um, approaches such as uh, you know, leveraging AI, leveraging user and entity uh, behavior analytics, all of those things to really assess the, uh, the behavior and the activity down to the user level and down to the human level. Um, in order to get that deeper insight and context. Um, of course, uh, user-focused processes um, when it comes to data loss prevention. So, um, you know, of course, I always say training and awareness goes such a long way. Uh, processes and policies that help people understand uh, what they should and shouldn't be doing when it comes to uh, sharing data um, or, you know, sending data outside of the, the network, even giving access to data within the company, all of those things are important. And all of these things ultimately tie into having a um, robust threat management program, right? When you have the visibility into your assets and you have the context, when you have that uh, deeper sort of um, uh, view of the user activity and the, uh, the human element and the lens there, that adds uh, uh, that adds value, and then when you have the user-focused processes um, like that training and awareness, all of that leads to more robust uh, threat management. This isn't again. Um, I, I do want to say here, like this isn't meant to be like all um, all encompassing. Um, I'm strictly focusing on the human element here because, right, you need um, all kinds of other elements from backup strategy to everything in between. Um, but I think at the human layer, these are some key things to, to keep in mind. And all of that, of course, leads to better uh, data protection against some of the modern insider threats um, that we are seeing across the industry. And so that, I think, is a good segue to now seeing, you know, how this can work in practice, right? I, you know, always say that, you know, theory and and talking through the examples and and you know, framing this up is always help, helpful, but it's even more helpful to see how this works. And so I am going to um, bring uh, Suzanne 
to the virtual stage to give us a look at what this can look like in reality. Thank you very much, uh, Christine. That's great. Yeah, I will um, going to share my screen and take it uh, through a cerebral overview, the solution that we will discuss. And I'm glad you brought up some of those great points during your segment, because a lot of those things, you know, the program, if you don't have a program, it doesn't mean you can't start immediately looking at what's going on in your environment, because that will help you to determine what your program should look like. Understand how your users operate. So the Cerebral platform, the overview that I'll give you, will look at those different capabilities and how you can take it from there. So let me start with just giving you the three pillars or the three directions that this one platform has. Security in the area of risk or in the area of threat, which really means let's assess the platform, let's look at, let's look at the users. So we're looking at a user-centric or human factor of what each employee is doing before we can determine if it's a threat. Part of it means that you're looking at the individuals, if they're engaged, if they're productive in those activities that might be considered security breaches, but are they being used for productivity? And then of course, the third piece is compliance. Uh, there are two kinds of compliance areas. One is of course the government compliance and regulations that every company who needs to follow them would monitor. And then of course every company has its own set of policies that they need to comply with. So knowing and understanding in a security and a cyberspace environment, what are those by company? And then the platform will look at giving you that information. So what is Cerebral? What can it do from a um, practical point of view? Uh, as Christine mentioned, you know, the data is fluid. So the ability to understand where the data comes from, uh, where it is, is, is key. But we've actually taken a, an approach to look at the data in two ways. One, of course, is to look at a behavior. Uh, so we're looking at behavior from a baseline. So we establish every single person's baseline. Anything, just like a credit card company, will establish your baseline of usage before it can detect that, you, that it might be a fraudulent transaction. In the world of monitoring, you're looking at every individual's behavior, establishing a baseline, and then comparing those activities that you see, which were referred to as user activity monitoring, if those activities are actually outside the baseline. Are they significantly outside the baseline or are they in line with a, um, a tolerance uh, rating? The third piece is we take those two components, the behavior analytics, the activity monitoring, and we group those together and yet take it one step further and give you a risk score. So looking at the proactive approach that Christina was mentioning to the reactive approach, looking at the predictive knowledge of your user and seeing if the propensity for them to be a risk is something you need to look forward, look towards. What is that called? We look, we use AI, so we use artificial intelligence. Uh, this is on, not on all based on rules that you have to write rules. Everything is all AI based. And of course, when you look at AI, you want to look at what does that mean to me? Um, so what we've done over the years is test our platform against certified data from the CERT Insider Threat Center. So there's a data set that exists that looks at 500 days of activities of either large businesses or government organization. And we've run our platform through this certification data and tested it for false positives or false alarms, essentially, and make sure that when we look at the data and we alert on things, we've already been through some sample data that is significant and already certified, and specifically by Palo Alto Research Center. 
insider risk, security, and compliance. Those things are all the three pieces, but let me just give you a couple of examples of what that means to be in compliance or out of compliance in this case. So today, we talk about remote workers a lot, and we talk about data moving from the office. And when I talk about moving, we're basically seeing employees reach the server where the data lo is located, pull that file down to their kitchen, to their desktop, to their car, wherever they are, and look at the information. Well, when, you, when the home office has the communication link, they know what and where the file is. But if that link is broken, then the violation, whether it's governmental or policy, is now breached and you need to take an action. Well, with our environment, the data continues to be collected locally, even if that direct link between the employee and the head office is broken, we continue to collect that data and we continue to send it through a Wi-Fi or whatever connection is available. Even if that link breaks or is unavailable, we still continue to send to collect the data and send it when that link is back up. All the data will be stored in uh, at the head office or wherever the, the server is located. So that was one one file, but now we're looking at a much more complex with potentially employees, half of the employees in a company choosing, because they're now given the option, to stay home and work remotely. So now the, the security becomes even more complex and more important to understand where all the data is located and what you need to do should you see something that is a breach or a data exfiltration or something that an employee shouldn't be doing. <clears throat> um, let me show you a little bit of how the environment works. So every single device from an employee, whether they're running it on a Mac or Microsoft operating system, an Android, or even uh, a Chrome device, all the data that is collected is sent through to the server, whether it's there at home or we're sending it through uh, a private cloud that the server has been deployed on. The data is then, of course, stored on the server to then determine the analytics. So all the analytics is done at the server level, and then the alerts are sent to the operator or whoever is determined to be the recipient of that information. What is that information? There's a lot of data that's collected. It's collected all the time or it can be collected during work hours. So everything that you decide when you deploy a recorder to an endpoint will be determined on the policies that you've prescribed for that user or group of users or division or location or country. So everything is very granular when it comes to monitoring every single, access, uh, every single piece of data. And what is that? So all the all the data that includes the file transfers, all the tracking of documents, and that's more important when you're talking about DLP because you're talking about documents, confidential information, IP information that is now distributed or accessible through different sources or even attachable to emails or attachable to chats. All these areas means you need to monitor even where that document goes. So it's one thing to track the document, but what if it's attached in an email? What if it's dropped into a chat? What, there are so many ways now that you can move documents. It might be even be to a cloud application or a cloud storage. So all the applications that are used, whether they're cloud-based or web-based or locally on their device is also logged and reported. All this data now becomes available for the AI or the machine language to do its thing and to begin to analyze. So when you analyze, you'll either determine that you want to mitigate the activities or you want to investigate a particular user. So it's always a choice between investigating or mitigating, being proactive or reactive. Those are the kinds of things, and you can decide when you want to collect all this data. 
We've also added something a little bit different in the industry, which is called psycholinguistics. So part of the email content does get analyzed for psycholinguistic capabilities, such as focusing on the I or the me in email content, or that the user might be disgruntled. The tone of the emails is also flagged as potentially something to look at. So all this information is either collected or not collected depending on the policy by user. So it's it's important that this data is available so that the user behavior analytic capabilities gets kicked up and then a risk score is then made available. So let me just show you real quick um, in the next few minutes a little bit of the platform. So what you're looking at here is the new release. Um, one thing I want to make sure for those who may have seen the previous releases, this is the 9.3 interface, which brings together all the endpoints and are able to see if the endpoints have responded, has check, have checked in, which ones are deployed. The interface specifically looks at the endpoints. We also have people views. We have uh, monitoring charts. So when you look at the people view, you're looking at groups, everything from just the administrators or just the finance. You can group all these different users into their particular section. And then, of course, when you're looking at setting up alerts or you're looking at configuring the platform, it's integrated with Active Directory. It's also capable of integrating with your SIM platform. So if you're using any syslog type format, it's exportable live directly all the time to this platform. And then you can take it one step further and look at that data and determine if you want to do some comparative analysis from the data that you've received with other security data that's been ingested on your SIM. All the rules and all the alert policies are all part of what you can set as well. This is, uh, from an analytical point of view, we talked about the risk score. So all the data that we collect from user activity monitoring to the behavior analytics, we combine 25 of those variables and set a score based on your parameters and then determine if this kind of activities has more of a propensity for being fraud or opportunistic data, threat, data theft. So we're always looking at establishing a score to help you hone in and focus on those particular pieces of information. When you build a risk score, you also build a flow of data. So part of it is to determine when you do your program is to determine the threat vectors or the threat chain. Those, those words you'll start seeing uh, when you begin to do a little bit more of determining how you want to start your program, but it's really to try to build what is it for you in your organization that creates that risk, that vector. Uh, of course, all this data is very important and you don't want it to be accessible to anyone. So we built, of course, the ability to select permissions and those permissions are role-based. So you create a user manager, for example, to see just their specific users within their department and see just those specific pieces of data that's been collected. So referred to feature-based. And then finally, event-based. All the data that I was mentioning earlier, you can turn on and turn off the viewing capabilities for all these different roles as well. Um, and. Um, once you've got all this data, you can see that this platform is really honing in on watching. We watch for you. You don't need to do any of that. We watch, we collect, we analyze, we alert. Those three big steps are the ones that will take you to you deciding that you're going to look at the data and you're gonna react, or you're gonna look at the data and take action to be more proactive. And when you look at the data, you can look at the data with what we refer to as eyes on glass. Anything that has to do with screenshots, we collect screenshots for every single event. We collect screenshots, in fact, all the time whenever there's an action or an activity that takes place. And you pretty much look at it in a video playback format. Just like when you would be doing a, um, a video 
creation. These are the same things. These are images, and you can extract them for sharing for uh, litigations or other. So with that, uh, that concludes my portion. And I can hand it over back to Christine. And Christine, uh, forget, <coughs> excuse me. So of course, if you have any questions, don't uh, hesitate to post them. Awesome, thank you, Suzanne. Yeah, that was a, a great um, overview. Um, so uh, yeah, one, um, we I think we have time to, to squeeze in one question. Um, so uh, one that I see, and we've been uh, answering some kind of through the, the chat as well. Um, can you talk more about how customers tend to approach um, uh, policy setting or like policy management? So it looks like there's a lot of great options available. Um, and so does the system make like like standard recommendations around what uh, what should happen? Does, does your team help with that or is it more on the customer to um, kind of set the expectations there? Yeah, no, that's a really good question because best practices for rules and setting of rules first comes from the the customer, the industry they're in, and then they can determine what is more what is critical to their environment. But we do have already set uh, about a hundred different dashboards to help you focus on security, productivity, uh, focus on applications, websites visited. Everything is already there, ready to go. So from a selection, they're all available and ready to be chosen. On the reports, it's kind of the same thing. We've created what the most used reports would be, and that would be, there's about 80 of those. When it comes to setting alerts, we have examples of alerts, you know, how much time is spent uh, wasting time or how much time or who is actually accessing a particular resource that might not be their own. So there's a lot of things that exist to help you build your policy based on what you want to try to achieve. But there are definitely programs and companies that can build assessments of where you stand today to help you pick what's important to you. But if you can think it, the data is there and we pretty much can give you the ability to pull the data any way you need to, whether it's from an alert or whether it's through an export capability as well. So we can help you guide you to what your goals are. Nice. Awesome. So yeah, it sounds like you can sort of meet people where they are, uh, yeah. you know, for folks who, um, you know, know exactly what they need. They have the options there, right? It sounds very um, easy to, to get that set up versus if you need a little bit more guidance, it sounds like yes. there's yep. personalization. Better. It's all yep. about who you are and what you need, where that's kind of where we want to be. Awesome. Love it, love it. Um, okay, well, yeah, I, I we've answered a couple of questions through the chat. I don't see any new ones. Any uh, final thoughts you want to share before I wrap things up, Suzanne? Uh, you know, the, just in general, the there's no need to wait <laughs> for making decisions like this. You know, it's all about getting ready for the day that you need to start looking at the data. Because if you wait and you want to investigate something that happened in the past it's the past. Until mm -hmm. we can travel <laughs> through time, the past is not available. So the sooner you start just collecting the data, you don't have to look at the data, just start collecting it and start building your program. And then when you're ready to turn it on, you already have the ability to look at and to start analyzing. Yeah, well well said. And I think a very uh, good point to close this, this out with, I can't tell you how many um, companies I talk to who sort of come to us, you know, after the fact um, and say, hey, how can we figure out what happened here? How can we like get inside this? And it's like, yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> while there are some things that can be done. Um, it's a little bit too late, right? You want to get have the data up front. Otherwise, it's it's hard to go back and, and try to get it after the fact. Yes. So, yeah. So yeah, completely agree. Well said. Um, well, thank you so much, Suzanne, for sharing your valuable you know, insight here and also for walking us through such a wonderful demo. Thank you. Yeah, and, and thank you to all of our attendees for spending uh, the last uh, hour with us. If you have any questions, please reach out to uh, the team at sales at variato.com. Uh, thanks again for joining and we hope you stay safe and secure out there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Christina. <laughs>